Welcome to the lecture on energy efficiency. In the big picture, we go all the way from natural resources on the right to human well-being on the left and looking at all the different conversion steps from resources to available energy carriers, from available energy carriers to useful energy carriers, then to energy demand by the products, then the services generated by the products and the contribution of the services to human well-being. And there's four steps here to decouple one process output from the next that we would label efficiency. On the demand side we have the efficiency by which services are provided by products, the service product efficiency. We also have the product energy efficiency, so the product operation that is possible with a certain amount of energy. On the energy supply side here on the right we have the efficiency by which the energy is made available from the primary energy carriers, for example power stations, and we have the energy extraction efficiency, for example how much energy do I get out from an oil well per energy invested. And during this lecture we will look at all these different efficiencies First again, looking and defining efficiency in general, then the product service efficiency, the product energy efficiency, these two are the demand side efficiency measures. Then we will look at the conversion efficiency in energy supply and at the resource extraction efficiency. Finally, a few comments on the limits to energy efficiency. In general, we define Efficiency is doing more with less. In mathematical terms, we define efficiency as useful output divided by necessary input. Here the example two processes are given, conversion process 1 and conversion process 2. Each of these processes has its own efficiency. E1, so the smaller lowercase e, is defined as the E intermediate divided by the incoming energy E in and the conversion efficiency of the second process is the E useful divided by E intermediate. Very simple definition equations and the major observation is here as you have a process chain the efficiencies along the process chain multiply. You can see it from the calculation down in the corner. So when you have a first process with a 90% efficiency of conversion and another process right after it with another 90%, the overall efficiency of these two processes combined will be 90 times 90%, that's 81%. And if you remember the service cascade I just showed you, there are many different efficiencies that are multiplied together, so this is quite an important observation here. The product service efficiency is defined as the physical service delivered, the useful output, divided by the number or the size of the products needed. Most prominent example here probably is the vehicle occupancy right. So vehicle drives along the road and the more people sit in the vehicle, the more efficient the service that is provided by the vehicle, because the mass of a person in a vehicle is very small compared to the overall vehicle mass so the vehicle engines performance hardly changes if a few more people sit in and the vehicle occupancy rate changes over time and across countries and it is one of the things that we would like to address with the digital transformation in urban transport that ideally there will be more people sitting in vehicles in the future to use those vehicles more efficiently. Most cars are built for five people and the typical occupancy rate is between 1.3 and 2 persons. So cars on average are more than half empty. That's of course not a very efficient use of them. Buildings have similar issues regarding product service efficiency. Here we see the net occupancy rate of bedrooms and hotels. And if you look at the numbers, you see most of the countries shown here have occupancy rate of below 50%, meaning hotel rooms in these countries are empty more than half of the time. 
That is, of course, sometimes unavoidable if you have seasonal hotels and so on, but it also points to an efficiency problem. We have a lot of built-up environment that is not used all of the time. Another example, which is not shown here, of service efficiency is the question of how much living space do you need to have a good experience in your dwelling. And this also differs a lot. In the US, the average dwelling space per capita is more than 70 square meter. In Ethiopia, it's 7 square meters. So you see there's a wide range of possible spaces and the question is how much do you need of dwelling space for a good well-being from the dwelling site? That is a research question that can be answered by researchers studying the relation between the stocks or the products that we use and the well-being they generate. Another indicator of product service efficiency is the amount of hours that appliances are used every week, the operating time of appliances. You see here in terms of hours per day that many appliances are not actually used very often. Which is fine because most of them are actually luxury goods, so we use them from time to time only. So the question is, which of these again really contribute to human well-being? So we probably would argue that a washing machine and a fridge actually does. But what about all the luxury devices that we use once, once a month or maybe only once a year? And another really important observation is that cars, passenger cars, are idle most of the time. There's a regular UK survey that finds, for example, in this version, that a typical car in the UK only drives around the roads for nine hours per week, whereas it stands still for 159 hours per week. So that is another important example of products that are not actually used very efficiently. Now moving on to the second topic, the product energy efficiency. Here we will define the product energy efficiency as the product operation that's possible with a certain energy input divided by that energy input. Typical example would be the kilometers driven per liter of gasoline. Now usually we take the inverse of that parameter, the specific energy requirement, the operational energy use needed divided by the desired product operation. Because the product operation is fixed, right? I would like to drive my car from here to the office. And so I can calculate with the specific energy requirement how much energy I need or how much gasoline I need for that. And you see here that different vehicle technologies in a different unit, miles per gallon, change their efficiency over time. So that's of course a major parameter that we can tweak using also engineering and vehicle design. And also the drive technologies matter a lot. One of the probably most interesting examples for efficiency at the product level are buildings. When we talk about energy efficiency in buildings, we need to answer three questions. First, where does the energy in the building go to? And the second, what can we do with the different energy applications? And then, if you combine all the different reduction measures, what is the overall result? So where does building energy go to? That depends on where the building is located, mostly about the climate and also about the affluence level and lifestyle of the people in it. Typical example here from high income countries is that a lot of building energy goes into heating and cooling. Here it is one third, 35%. Lighting is also a big chunk and water heating. So these two together usually already account for two thirds of building energy consumption. And in buildings, a lot can be done. Most important energy saving and thus energy efficiency measure in building is of course building insulation. The walls, the floors, the ceiling, but also the window. For example, using triple glazed windows to have a very high thermal resistance. Ventilation heat exchange is another technology, right? So instead of having the windows open, you have an air exchange that also has heat exchange that can save a lot of energy. 
and so on. So there are active solutions like this heat exchange and there are passive solutions like the way you construct the buildings or the way you design shading into the building. And as a result, we have building energy standards. So we take the best available technology for building in a certain country, depending on its affluence level, and then this country will define, okay, for us now with these technologies and what we assume people can reasonably afford to invest in their building, we define the best practice for energy standard that would be the A standard. So you, you see here quite low numbers down to less than 50 kilowatt hour per square meters and per year. And then higher standards would be B or C standards, so still okay and very inefficient buildings like old buildings, uninsulated buildings would then get a very bad ranking in this energy standard. So for buildings it is about understanding where the energy is used and then identifying the specific measures and estimating how they can contribute to making an individual building more efficient. Back to vehicles now, we see that the vehicle carbon intensity has slowly decreased over time in many countries, mostly due to efficiency measures. Better engines, better aerodynamics, different material choice, for example high strength steel or aluminium, drive technology changes of course, right, going from gasoline to diesel and then maybe to hybrid or to fully electric vehicles, and also fuel shift that comes along with some drive technologies. What really matters when it comes to efficiency in vehicles is the size. So this graph really shows you that size matters. Here we see the change in fuel consumption, which is an energy efficiency measure of the car for different car segments. That's for the US here. And you see that's a factor of almost two between the small city vehicles, city vehicles and the large SUVs. So size is the single most important factors. You can combine size with occupancy rates. So having relatively many people in a relatively small car gives you a very good service efficiency of the gasoline or other fuel used in that car. Function also matters, for example, whether or not you use the AC or all other ancillary functions like seat heating that the um, vehicle has. And of course, the driving style matters to some extent. A similar story applies to energy efficiency in appliances, where also we have regular reviews of best practices. For example, we would say now for freezes and refrigerator, it's best practice to actually have a second thermodynamic cycle next to the main one that's already used. In dishwashers, we could think of adding heat pumps, heat exchanges, or heat storage, which is commonly not done yet, but is considered best practice and the same for washing machines. And also, whenever that's possible, using smaller and higher efficiency electromotors, using better insulation like heat insulation and reduce idle time of gadgets and devices is an efficiency measure wherever that's possible. And just an example here. When I grew up, my grandma had such a coal-fired kitchen oven on the left side, which is not very efficient to use at all. And today I use an induction stove in my kitchen. So you can see here only like 40 years in between. And there's a huge improvement in technology, material use and also efficiency. Next big topic is energy efficiency in industry. Industry is one of the large energy consumers next to buildings and vehicles. So energy efficiency in industry is closely monitored because we need to know what's going on and also what realistic savings potential we still have. You see here in the EU that there has been an increase in efficiency in different industry sectors, different material production like cement, paper, machinery production and so on. And this is basically the result of combining different measures. There's, of course, again, the process efficiency in different material production and manufacturing processes like heat recovery, efficiency of scale, like using larger facilities or trying to operate at full capacity, reduce idle time. That also helps increase efficiency. 
Then there's feedstock related efficiency, for example, using recycled paper or recycled steel instead of primary steel that can bring down energy consumption a lot. And also it's quite important single strategy to change the composition of cement using different minerals or maybe using also some waste products that can also bring down efficiency in this major industry. And then we have the demand related efficiency, maybe the structure of the sector changes as a whole. So for example, if you go from bulk materials to pharmaceuticals, then the overall energy efficiency of the chemical sector will go down. Sorry, the efficiency will go up and the energy consumption will go down per value added. Energy efficiency is one of the major sustainability indicators that's communicated widely to the general public. In many countries it's, it's now even mandatory to do that. So whenever you go to a shop in the EU and would like to buy let's say a new fridge or a new vacuum cleaner, these labels here, these energy efficiency labels are put on display. So you can immediately get an idea of what the performance of this device is. So here in the lower right corner, the volume of the fridge, the noise level, and also then the energy consumption and the energy consumption is ranked according to what is currently best practice, the A++++ and what's considered outdated standards that would be like C or D standards. So this gives every consumer a direct information about the relative and absolute energy performance of the device they want to buy and it's mandatory for a wide range of devices these days. Conversion efficiency in energy supply changes over time and with technology. Here I put up the example from heat pumps directly taken from an overview from the Wikipedia showing different heat pump technologies and how they perform at different temperature differences. The major heat pump indicator is the COP, the coefficient of performance. Very simply it's defined as the heat that is pumped, so to say, so that moves from the outside into the building, divided by the work needed to do that. That's usually electricity. And you see here a wide range of numbers and also quite large differences between individual technologies. So there is definitely a way for improvement. Heat pump technology changes and can change for the better. And that means you as a consumer or an industrial user you have then a certain range of products you can buy from and then adjust your efficiency strategy accordingly. Another category of efficiency is the resource extraction efficiency. So how much energy, water, capital do I need to invest to get a certain natural resource? And in the energy indicators lecture we already talked about the energy return on investment which is the major energy related resource indicator. Here I want to put a slightly different focus and have a look at the materials, especially the ores, and how the ore grade declines over time. What is the ore grade? It is the amount of metal oxide in an ore divided by the total mass of the ore. And you see in general for this quantity there's a slowly declining trend for the different minerals shown here. So we have copper, lead, zinc and gold for example and also nickel. Many of these materials are also quite relevant for the energy transition. The ore grade declines because as technology advances we can harvest or mine deposits that were previously not economic. That's one of the main reasons. Another reason is that many of the easy to mine deposits have already been depleted so we kind of have to move on to lower grade ore resources because we still need a lot of materials. For most materials demand at the global scale is actually increasing. So the resource extraction efficiency for most ores, most minerals is actually going down these days and that is also a longer process over time and this is a negative feedback in the sustainable development process because declining resource extraction efficiency means 
more land, more water, more energy needed per ton of metal oxide extracted. That leads to higher costs in many cases. And on top of that, we have then, because of these high land uses, for example, also concerns about supply risks and scale-up limits, because at some point, if mines get too big, there may be local resistance, projects may become infeasible. So many researchers and government agency, and of course also industry, carefully monitor the development of metal and other mineral supply these days, and especially the ore grade and resource extraction efficiency in more general terms. Now at the end of this lecture I would like to make a few remarks about the limits to energy efficiency. We have seen in the other energy related lectures that there are thermodynamical limits, there are also practical limits. I here want to make a proposal that we can divide the limits into two groups. There are the technological limits and there's the social limits. The first technological limit for energy efficiency is the investment payoff time and the capital inertia. What does it mean? Very simple. When you have a car and the car is five years old, you most likely won't buy a new car soon. You've made an investment, it cost you a lot of money, and now you use that investment. Maybe in 10 years from now it's time to think about the new car. Same in industry. Industry works in investment cycles. So even though better technology available is available already now, the industry still needs to wait for a payoff time for the old investment to pay off. And that means new technology cannot be introduced right away. It takes time for the old technology to be slowly phased out because it is capital intensive, labor intensive and so technology transformation takes time. Typical vehicle lifetime is about 15 years so every 15 years in most countries we have a complete exchange of the passenger vehicle fleet so it would take 15 years for new technology to come in. Buildings in many countries have a much longer lifetime so Replacing the current building stock in Europe with fully passive houses would take centuries. Capital inertia have to be factored in when thinking about how new technology can be scaled up. The second big limit to energy efficiency is the technology learning process. At some point, some technologies just become mature. With the current knowledge and current materials, we have done what we could for example, improving combustion engines or improving electromotors. So there are not so many new things that can be done. Maybe the few remaining things are too costly. So as a lot of research is done on individual technologies, they can improve, but at some point they will be considered mature and not much more will be possible. For example, for windows, right, the feature of the window is you can look through it. So people can move from single glass, double glass, now to triple glass windows. But every new sheet of glass also decreases the reflectivity, decreases the light that's coming through and the visibility. So there's a trade-off, for example. Last technological limit is the scaling limits. They are just physical limits to a size of installation. So you, even though it would increase efficiency, at some point you don't have the strength of the materials or just the ability to build certain devices. For example, wind turbines can be scaled up a lot, but at some point, even though even larger wind turbines would be more efficient, the materials are not there to do this economically or even physically. Similar issue is with chemical plants. Chemical reactors can be scaled up to some extent, but if you scale up even further, like a blast furnace for making iron, for example, the process is also impossible to control. So scaling limits also exist. Then we have three limits at the social side. The first one is a simple awareness and acceptance limit. For example, cons customers or industry agents may simply not be aware that certain technologies already exist and are actually economic. But even if awareness exists, there may be acceptance limits. Public resistance, ethical considerations, or 
the actual or perceived fear of negative impacts. For example, when people would have to leave their homes for a new hydro dam to be built or if the value of land would decrease because high voltage transmission lines are being planned. These are all issues that can ex affect the acceptance of new projects and thus also of efficiency of the grid overall. We have ethical limits that's particularly relevant when it comes to data protection. So many efficiency measures are linked to big data and data processing, also harvesting data across households or um, consumers. And that has some ethical limitations and concern that needs to be taken into account. The last limit to process efficiency, energy efficiency at the social side is the importance of a business case for efficiency. Many businesses report that energy efficiency is only worth investing in if the payoff time is less than a year. If the company's business is to sell fruits or to build vehicles, often energy efficiency in like ancillary installations like maybe canteens or the research and development section of the company are not their main priority. So if you want to save energy there in places that are not the core business of a company, they can't invest many resources into it. So they would expect very short payoff times, only then they would do it. So this is actually a limit to the implementation of more efficient technologies at the company level. Here an example for one of the limits, which is the technology learning limit. So as energy is a major cost factor in almost all material production, the material producers have always strived to reduce energy consumption, not because of sustainability concerns, not because of climate concerns, but simply because of cost concerns. The steel industry, for example, has become ever more energy efficiency efficient over the last 180 years or so. And as a consequence, most of the energy savings potential in that industry has already been seized. There is not much left to gain. And the empirical data, the left side for steel, on the right side for cement, actually demonstrate that the efficiency potential was there, but by now most of it has been seized already. Now let's have a look towards the end of this lecture at the system level. So we go beyond the process level and see what could limit energy efficiency at the system scale. And here I just want to put up a few examples. One of them is the rebound effect that always has to be taken into account when evaluating efficiency at the system level. What does it mean in this particular case? You see here a time series for the average fuel consumption of newly registered passenger vehicles in Germany. If we become more and more efficient in our vehicles, we would expect that this curve goes down steadily. But in fact, you see it's rising again. Why? Very simple, because people buy bigger cars. So even though the individual car may get more efficient per service delivered, depending on its size, if the overall consumption of service and of large vehicles increases, the efficiency improvements are just eaten up by the increase in consumption or increase in size. Rebound effect means here that products become more efficient and thus you save money on them, right? If your car is more fuel efficient, you have more money available during the use phase. So you can just choose on buying a bigger car in the first place with the same money. And we see it actually happens. And we see that it's very important to also have policies at the system levels and not just at the product level, because the overall sustainability performance is decided at the system level. So this example here of increasing specific fuel consumption of newly registered vehicles is just one out of many examples that show you that not only deficiency of the individual device matters, but also the consumption levels and the consumption mix. So which different products at which sizes are bought. 
Another limit next to the rebound effect to efficiency at the system level is the resource limit that we have. Globally and also in many regions we have physical limits to the available land, available water resource, available minerals and available scrap that we can recycle from. Here just as one example there's a scale up. What is the land needed if everybody would have the same diet of a certain country. So you can see here if we scale up the nutrition habits, the diets of individual countries to the global level, we could see how these land masses needed for that would perform in terms of what we actually have available. This is just one illustration that many lifestyles, many consumption levels globally are not scalable. We just use too much the global scale we just simply do not have so much land and other resources available to have a certain lifestyle so again this links you back to the challenge of sustainability at the system level we can not only rely on energy efficiency alone we also need to address the total demand level that becomes more and more urgent as the time to actually do something seriously about sustainability shrinks rapidly so energy efficiency can bring you a long way but you also need to look at the system level you need to look at the consumption levels to then make sure that the scale up of lifestyles in the future will not exceed global resources as shown here for many countries but actually will stay in line with the biophysical capacity of this planet thank you for your attention